we're, we're going to finish out the, the book of Daniel. So I went back and looked at my notes, and we've been talking about Daniel since the 1st of March. So uh, we, we've been going like a herd of turtles through this. Uh, but it's been good, and we've actually done a verse-by-verse study of the entire book of Daniel. Every once in a while we have someone say, well, why don't you all ever do just a, you know, expository verse-by-verse study? And I think, you haven't been here on Wednesday night, have you? Because Dr. Jeff and I, we do that nearly all of the time, where we go through every verse uh, in the Bible in a particular book. And uh, let me tell you, that, that's good. We, we should be doing that. And so there's different types of uh, uh, preaching, and so... There are different things, and we want you to experience all of them. So if you have Daniel chapter 12, we're going to finish out the the chapter. And most of this chapter is about the end time or the last days. And I'm very convinced that you live in the last days right now. And I can prove that biblically. When Peter got up to preach on the day of Pentecost, he answered a question, and they, they asked, what shall we do? And then he began to preach, and he said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, saith the Lord, I will. So the, the last age, we could call it the age of grace or the age of the church, uh, whatever you want to uh, put on that, uh, began after the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the beginning of the church in Acts chapter 2 that's empowered by the Holy Spirit. So we're not looking for a different dispensation. We're not looking for another event. We're looking at the last uh, uh, hurrah, if you will, of the earth, and we're getting closer all the time. Matter of fact, I think Sunday morning we're going to talk about the world that we live in, and if you've watched the news lately, the world that we live in is just getting crazier all the time, isn't it? And uh, so the Bible actually tells us. So if you have Daniel 12, let me read. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, There shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness shall... uh, like the stars forever and ever. They're going to shine like the stars forever and ever. So let's just take the very beginning of the verse at that time. Say that with me. At that time. Now what time is he talking about? Well, he's been talking in the last about uh, two or three chapters about some events that's going to happen in the last days. So if we take chapter 11 and chapter 12 and kind of merge them together, he is giving us some indication of what's going to happen in the last days of this earth. So we're being framed in the the time frame here of the chapters of 11 and 12. So this is what we know just from reading and discussing and teaching on what we have just for the last two or three times. Um, There's coming a world world ruler that's going to oppose God. This world ruler will make a treaty with the people of God. And we think it's going to be for a seven-year period, pretty clear. He shall profane the temple and commit abomination. He will magnify himself above every god. He will have no regard to the god of his fathers, nor have desire for women. And the only force he will honor will be the the god of forces or the god of war. So this is uh, a little bit of the leading up to at this time. Now he said at that time, Michael, the archangel... He's called the Prince of God here. Will stand up and watch over the sons of your people. And and obviously he's talking to Daniel, who is a Hebrew. And he says that he shall stand up and there shall be a time of trouble. Such as never was since there was a nation even to this time. So our world has seen a lot of trouble, hasn't it? But how many of you know the, the greatest troubles yet to come according to Scripture? So Michael, that warring archangel that opposes Satan, he's watching over the people of God, and he's protecting the people of God, and he's especially standing guard over Israel. Now look at this uh, line, there shall be a time of trouble. Israel will be persecuted, and, and we know that that is true. 
And they have been persecuted, and they have been scattered and persecuted over many nations and over a lot of time. If we would just kind of go on a, a little memory trip here, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and then if we kind of go back further, the Egyptians, they were in bondage over 400 years with the Egyptians. I would say that's a lot of persecution, wouldn't you? And especially in the 20th century. Uh, the Holocaust, we know about 6 million Jews were exterminated, uh, consumed during that uh, time in the 20th century. It actually began in the 30s, all the way through the end of World War II. I'd like to tell you this contempt for Israel has stopped, but it has not. So I want to read some things uh, to you that you may know and you may not know. Uh, this is about the world's view of Israel even today, right now. As of 2013, Israel has been condemned in 45 resolutions by the United Nations Human Rights Council. Since the creation of the council in 26, uh, year 2006, it has resolved almost more resolutions condemning Israel than on the rest of the world combined. Let me just give you a little interpretation of that they have been um, condemned by resolutions since 2013 uh, more than any other nation or any other nations combined so the world does not have a good view of israel uh, 16 countries do not accept israeli passports algeria bangladesh brunei Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Malaysia, Oman, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Sudan, Syria, and Yemen. So if you have an Israeli passport, you cannot fly into or go into any of those countries if you are a Jew. So they will not allow you to be there. In 2018, the United Nations issued 27 condemnations to nations. Out of the 27 condemnations... 21 uh, of them were against Israel. So if I ask you, does the world have some type of issue or anger with Israel? And your answer would be what? Absolutely yes. In Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, uh, Jeremiah talks about this trouble that Israel is going to happen. And um, I, I don't know if you have watched the news the last year or so. We, we do know that President Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And I don't know um, many nations that even thought that was a good idea. Most of them condemned that. But today we have seen two or three peace agreements between the Israelis and some of the Arab nations. So much so that some are going to nominate him for the Nobel Prize. Peace Prize for those uh, initiatives. Now, whether he would receive that prize or not, I don't know, but uh, we do know there's a lot of contempt against Israel. Now, this is what the Bible says about this great and terrible day, this time of trouble. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. So, here it's called a time of trouble. Uh, Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Matthew chapter 24, Jesus addressed this in verse 21. For then shall be great tribulation, such as what was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor even shall be. So Jesus addresses this, and he said this time that's coming is going to be like any other time. No other time can compare to it. And what are we talking about? We're talking about the last days of this world, and we would maybe... Uh, calling it the Great Tribulation. So Revelation chapter 12, uh, again, the Bible talks about this time. And if you go back to the first part of chapter 12, it, it begins by seeing a woman, uh, sun, moon, stars. And the description of this woman is very reminiscent of what Jacob dreams, or Joseph dreams all the way back in the book of Genesis, the son of Jacob, uh, Joseph. And so what he is dreaming is about the nation of Israel. 
But what I want you to see in verse 13, And when the dragon, and we know who the dragon is, that's Satan, saw that he, the, the child that was born of this woman, was cast into the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of, great, of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place, where she is nourished for a time, times, and half a time from the face of the serpent. And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened up her mouth and swallowed up the flood, which the dragon cast out of, out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth, or angry with the woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which kept the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now there's something in there that you might want to just note here that this time that this woman is um, being nourished, but yet being challenged at the same time. Because the dragon or the serpent is trying to destroy the woman. Because the woman gave birth to the man-child, and this is what I believe, and I think the Bible is very clear, the woman represents Israel, and the man-child that came out of Israel was Jesus Christ, the Messiah. But look with me that this time that's given in verse 14 is time, times, and half a time. We're going to see this repeated over and over and over again. Time, times, half a time. So if we take a time as a year, and times plural, which is two, and half a time, it always equals out to three and a half years. So just keep that in mind. So now at the end of verse 1 in Daniel chapter 12, at, the, at this time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. How many of you know God keeps books? And He keeps pretty good books, doesn't He? And um, the, uh, the books that I know He keeps, number one, is called a book of life, or the Lamb's book of life. And uh, all of our names need to be in that book. And the only way you get your name in that book is you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But also there is a book written of the deeds that we have done. And uh, one of the good news is God remembers. And some of the bad news is God remembers, right? <laughs> but the way that we get these things blotted out of the book, and it's interesting to me, the Bible uses the term blotted. You ever notice that? We would never use that term in 2020. Because back in those days, they had ink, and they had papyrus, they had paper, scrolls. And the way that you deleted something out of a ledger is that you couldn't erase it. The only way you could delete it is what? You blotted it out. The term blotted out to your sins is used too. So what we would use in 2020, we would say he would delete it. But back then, in that culture, in that time, they couldn't delete it, so they blotted so I'm glad that my sins have been blotted out and some of the bad things I've done has been blotted out and my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So verse 1, the people shall be delivered, everyone is found written in the book. So there's a promise of deliverance. He said they will be delivered. Now Paul says something in, in the book of Romans that sometimes is very difficult to, for us to understand. But he talks about Israel and the nation and the people in verse number 25 of chapter 11. And th there is this um, conflict, obviously, that Paul has in his missionary journeys. You know, he's preaching grace. He's preaching Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But many of the places and the people he goes to are Jewish, and they are still into the law. And so it's a conflict between Paul and these, uh, the, these Jewish people. But even in the midst of that, Paul tells us that God still has a heart for his people, uh, Israel. So look with me at verse 25. For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery. So he uses the Greek word mysterion, which means it's veiled or we don't see it clearly. So this mystery, he says, is this. Lest you should be wise in your own opinion that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come. And so all Israel will be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion, and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. 
For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So God made a covenant with Israel, and he's going to remember that covenant. But he says, at this time, a blindness has come to Israel. Most of you are Bible scholars. You read the Bible. You know what the Bible says. And we can clearly see Jesus the Messiah in the Old Testament. And Jesus himself said, search the scriptures because they testify of me. And the only scriptures they had when he said that was the Old Testament. And so when we look at Isaiah 53, we look at um, maybe Isaiah 14, a virgin shall uh, bring forth a child. Uh, we, we look at all of these uh, verses that are messianic then we, you and I, can see Jesus as that promised Messiah that's coming. But what Paul says here, that for some reason the Jewish people kind of have a blindness. They, they, they just really can't see that. They don't understand that. And, and I don't know why. He says it's a mystery. But he says one day that when the fullness of Gentiles has come and the time of the Gentiles is over, God's going to turn his heart back to his people. So what does the term, the fullness of the Gentiles, mean? Well, I, I, I've taught on this a lot of times, and, and, and I think people misunderstand that there's a pattern in the Bible. How many of you believe God has order and structure in His Word? And so if I ask you, the, the beginning of the kingdom message, the beginning of salvation... Who was that first offered to? And you would tell me it was to the Jewish people. Even Jesus had an encounter with the Syrophoenician woman, and he made it clear. He said, this is for the Jewish people, but yet he still healed her daughter of demonic possession. It's only until Acts chapter 10 that we have first a record of a Gentile being saved. It is the Italian uh, centurion that is a very good man, but he is instructed by an angel to send for Peter to come and preach the gospel to him. And while Peter's preaching the gospel of Christ to him, he receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit because Peter said that these people received it just as we did in the beginning. So that's the first time that we have recorded of a, uh, a Gentile being saved. Of course, from that time, we know that Paul went to the Gentiles and much of his ministry, most of his ministry was to the Gentiles. So God turned from the nation of Israel, and Paul even illustrated this in one of his uh, uh, messages to those Jews. He says, lo, that you have seen that you have judged yourself unworthy, you've rejected the message of Christ. He said, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So for the last 2,000 years, we as Gentiles, and, and, and maybe you're Jewish, maybe you are from the lineage of the, the patriarchs, uh, I don't know who I am. I'm Heinz 57, I guess. But this is what we know. Th there is a turn to the Gentiles. So God's grace and His righteousness has turned to all people. It is His will that none should perish, but all should be saved. And so He's turned to everyone. But is there going to be a time that the Gentiles, their time is up, and then He turns back to His Jewish people just as it started could it be it ends the same way? Now, if I just surmised here and, and get, just kind of give you my opinion, uh, I believe that one day Jesus Christ is going to come back. That's not my opinion. That is the Word of God. But there's going to be a rapture, and we're going to be caught up, and we're going to be with Jesus in the air. And the Bible says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Now, is that the time of the Gentiles being over? possibly, or could it be at the uh, end of the first three and a half years of the Great Tribulation? And that's a very possible time, too, because we're going to look at a scripture that may indicate that. So if we look here in Romans 11, he says, this deliverer that comes out of Zion is going to turn the ungodliness of Jacob around, and he said, I made a covenant with them, and I will take away their sins. But if we look back to the scripture that we have in uh, Daniel, he said it's only those who are written in the book. So I'm not saying that wicked people are going to be saved no matter what nationality they are. How many of you, the only way you're going to be saved is you've got to come to Christ. So that blindness that Israel has, I think it's going to be taken away from them, 
And then they're going to begin to see very clearly that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. So look with me at verse 2. We're moving real fast here, right? We finished one verse. Verse 2, Daniel 12. Now he gives us the promise of a resurrection. So the first is the promise of deliverance. The second is the promise of a resurrection. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So he says that those who are asleep, and that word there means they're dead, and they're dead in the dust of the earth. And the Lord told uh, us about Adam. Adam came from the dust of the earth, and after you die, if you're dead long enough, you're going to return back where? To the dust of the earth. So um, that resurrection, some to everlasting life, some to shame and after la- everlasting contempt. Now this word contempt means abhorrence. Abhorrence. It is the fate of those who don't know Jesus Christ, and it is abhorrence to think what's going to happen to the lost. So tonight, if you don't know Jesus Christ, you need to know Him because the result of you not knowing Him is absolutely horrific. Absolutely horrific. Now, there's, there's something in the bottom of this uh, passage, verse 3, so we know there's going to be a resurrection, and that res- resurrection is going to be some saved to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But he says there's going to be some that are going to share their faith, and they're going to turn many to righteousness, and they're going to shine like the stars forever and ever. So I think it behooves us to, to realize God is using us to share the message, correct? And there is a special place in God's heart for those who witness, for those who share their faith and and the gospel. Now look at verse number 4. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. So he's telling Daniel, this prophecy, these words that I'm giving you, are to be kept until the end of time. And at the end of time... We're going to understand this, and people are going to read it. Now, he tells us in this passage what will be the characteristics of the time of the end. I don't know if you caught it or not. He said, many shall what run to and fro, which means there's going to be a lot of rapid transportation. I would say our transportation system today in 2020 is much different than Daniel's transportation system. Um, uh, maybe choices or availabilities back in the B.C. years. For thousands of years, to get to one place and another was pretty much fixed. You either had a fast horse, camel, mule, chariot, or something. Other than that, you're done, right? Not today. We have bullet trains. We have supersonic jets. We have cars that even drive themselves today, right? And uh, we have some people who need cars that drive themselves. You know, in the last probably two or three months, I've had to pull over to the other side of of the lane that I'm in because people are on their phone. I was driving... To Wichita Falls, and I was just west of uh, Warica before the curve where you go across the, the, the bridge, the Red River Bridge, and, and I noticed this car just kept veering over and crossed the center lane, and I had to pull almost over to the ditch, and this girl, she's driving, and she got her phone up just like that, and I was thinking if I was a highway patrolman, I would pull her over and give her the biggest ticket I could give her. And then uh, just a day or two, I was going to Duncan, same thing. Somebody's veering over to my side. I'm having to get over. I look up, same thing. They're on their phone. And I'm thinking, goodness gracious, when will these people learn? But transportation's changed, hasn't it? And so he says, many shall be going to and fro. So most of the people who live in those days, very rarely did they get out of a, a very large circle of where they lived. 
Many people lived and died within a 30-mile or 40-mile circular place. And even until uh, the turn of the 1900s, many people lived in a very small area. Not today. We go all over the world. And uh, I remember when I was growing up, just a little trip down memory lane, we would get groceries about once every two weeks. And it usually came when payday came along. So for Steve and I to go to Duncan, we always lived way out in the country. Um, for us to go to Duncan was like a huge trip. And now we may go two or three times a day. So we would maybe go outside of our little area once every couple of weeks. And to go somewhere and someone buy you a Coke, a cola. It was a huge deal because we never had those things at home. You either drank, you know, water or coffee or tea. That was about the extent of anything available in our house. And um, so if, if you uh, went somewhere and put the nickel in to the soda machine and turned the crank or made it go up and down the little thing and pulled it out, anybody have any memories of those machines? And uh, then it went to a dime and then it went to a quarter. Uh, I don't know how much it is now. It's about a dollar, I think, in a machine now. You have to roll your dollar in. But uh, you have to put your credit card in. So times have changed. And in Daniel's time, it was that way. Most people didn't get out of a very big area. But he said in the last days, people are going to what? They're going to be going to and fro. And now here's the second thing it tells us. It says the knowledge shall what? Increase. I, I did a little study today. According to most resources, human knowledge is doubling every 12 months. So everything we know in 12 months, there's that much more information that's coming. This is from Digital Journey. In 1900, knowledge doubled every 100 years. In 1950, knowledge was doubling every 25 years. And the prediction is, in the next few months, and maybe just a few years, knowledge will be doubling every day. That everything that humanity knows in this digital age that we live in, that now you can have access to twice as much knowledge because of our technology, and it may be coming in just days, that the knowledge out there is, is doubling at a very fast pace. So every year is doubling um, and, and then doubling, and then doubling. Isn't that amazing? But here's the thing. The Lord told Daniel, this is going to be the signs of the end. How many of you think we're living there? We're living there right now, and uh, that's what he's telling Daniel. And that's what Daniel's telling us. Look at verse 5. Then I, Daniel, looked, and there stood two others, one on this riverbank and the other on that riverbank. So, we have two angelic beings, one on one side of the river, one on the other. And one said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river, How long shall the fulfillment of these wonders be? Now the angels aren't saying this to one another because they don't know. Because they're doing it for Daniel's sake because they're going to reveal this to Daniel because they're there with the message. Verse 7, Then I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the river when he held up his right hand and his left hand to heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it shall be for a time times and half a time and when the power of the holy people has been completely shattered all these things shall be finished do you recognize the phrase there we looked at before time times and half a time now this length time times and half a time uh, i believe it's Pretty accurate to say this is three and a half years. Does this appear several times in the Bible? And the answer is yes. So let's kind of put it in reverse. Daniel chapter 7, verse 25. Then he shall speak words against the Most High. Now who are we talking about here? We're talking about the Antichrist, man of sin, son of perdition. So Daniel talks a lot about this leader who's going to come on the horizon, and he's going to be the one who brings this devastation down on the nation of Israel. But really, the power behind this one is who? It's Satan, the serpent. So the wicked one. He shall speak words against the Most High. He shall wear out the saints of the Most High. So there's the persecution. He shall think to change the times and the law. 
and they shall be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. So here again we have the same thing. Uh, Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. And he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. But in the middle of the week he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate even unto the consummation which is determined is poured out on the desolate. So we believe the one week is seven years. And if he breaks it in the middle of the week, so half of seven is what? Three and a half. So we keep getting this number over and over and over again. This is Revelation chapter 11. But leave out the court which is outside the temple. Now we're talking about measuring. And do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city under foot for 42 months. So if you take 42 months, it equals what? Three and a half years. So this time is being shown to us over and over and over and over again. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. I want to guarantee we have more than two or three witnesses here. So God wants you to know and he wants me to know what it's going to be like at the end of this age, at the end of this world. And there is going to be a three and a half year period that's absolutely going to be horrible. Revelation chapter 11 verse 3. And I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. And if you figure that out, how long is it? Three and one half years. Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And he was given authority to continue for 42 months. And 42 months again is what? Three and one half years. Now, the one that's given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy is the man of sin, the son of perdition, uh, the Antichrist. So there again... He's going to have his way for three and a half years. Okay, let's go back to Daniel 12. Now, I, I threw these other verses in here. I mean, this is a Bible study. How many of you know it's all right to use the Bible in church? Amen. So this is a Bible study. So the only way that you can authenticate what the Bible says is it has to be confirmed by other Scripture. So the Bible actually interprets itself. Uh, verse 8, Although I heard, I did not understand. Then I said, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified, made white, refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now let's stop right there. Let me tell you something. You know what we're doing tonight? We're understanding what the Word of God says. You are understanding what the Word of God says. But there is most of the world out there if they read this, they wouldn't have a clue what it, what it means. Not only would they not have a clue, they don't care what it means. Let me tell you why. Because they're wicked. And they're going to continue to do wickedness. So he says that we're going to seal this book. He's going to talk about it here in a minute again. We're, we're, we're going to seal these, these words. That we're going to close them up till the time of the end. And he said, from the time these words are spoken... Until these are all fulfilled, he said there's going to be many purified, made white, refined. You know what that's saying? There's going to be a lot of people saved, aren't there? That's good news. You know, there's a lot of sects, denominations, groups. They think they're the only ones going to go to heaven. How many of you believe heaven's a lot bigger than that? Um, if you believe in Jesus Christ, if you put your trust in Him, and if you walk the way of the Lord, I believe you're going to go to heaven, don't you? And uh, I don't think the, the name on the shingle outside is going to save you. I think it's the Lord inside of you that's going to save you. So he said there's many that is going to be purified, made white, refined. But the wicked, they're just going to be wicked. And they're not going to understand these words, Daniel. Verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice is taken away, and the abomination of the desolation is set up. There shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. So the 1,290 days is right roughly about three and a half years. 
In the Jewish calendar, they don't really don't do uh, 365 days. They do more like a 360 days, and then every few years there's a correction there. So that's roughly about three, uh, three and a half years, give or take a few, few days. Now, to me, this next number is a mystery, but I'm going to just give you what possibly it could be. There's another number given here, 1,335 days. So there's a 45-day difference in these two numbers, a 45-day difference. Many scholars, many commentaries believe that the, the ending of the Great Tribulation is going to be the 1,290 days or the three, three and a half years. So in that three, three and a half years, that's when the Great Tribulation stops and then Jesus is going to come and make war against the Antichrist and the nations that align with him. And some scholars believe that that 45-day difference is the time when he destroys the nations. There's Armageddon. Uh, he, he, he takes, uh, well, actually an angel does it, but the Lord takes us, the, the, the Antichrist, the man of sin, and the false prophet, they're thrown into the lake of fire. And then Jesus comes in and he crosses the Kidron Valley and he goes in and he sets up his kingdom rule. And we know he's going to have what we know as the millennial reign of Christ. And he's going to rule and reign for a thousand years. So many believe that that 45 day uh, discrepancy is from the time that the great tribulation is over until Jesus Christ sets up his reign on this earth. Now, is that correct? I don't know. That's what a lot of people believe. But it says, Blessed is he who waits and comes to the 1,335 days. Why would you be blessed if you could make it to that, um, that time frame or that day? Because it could be at that day you see him setting up his kingdom and you made it to that point. Does that make sense? Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know, but that's what many people believe. But the first number is pretty much roughly um, a three, three and a half uh, year period now look at verse number 13 which is the last of Daniel uh, chapter 12 but you go your way till the end for you shall rest and will arise to your inheritance at the end of the days so basically what he's going to tell Daniel is Daniel you're going to die you're going to rest in the earth you're, you're going to be gone and all these days are going to pass, these years are going to pass, but when the end of days come, if we go back to what we studied earlier, there will be a resurrection, right? And he says, and at that time, you're going to arise to your inheritance at the end of days. So you're going to be resurrected, and all the things that uh, is to you and for you is going to come to you. Now, I want to stop here because we have gone through several months just 12 chapters. But what are those 12 chapters telling us? Could we just do a little review here? I think one of the biggest things that it tells me is Daniel is living in a hostile world, in a hostile environment. He's living in a culture that is very worldly and very anti-God. And folks, the longer you and I live, we're living in a culture and a world that is increasingly anti-God. And I think you would agree with me. Um, we started back in the 60s. Our kids could not stand in school and say the Lord's Prayer, although a lot of schools continued that way past that, and some are still doing that. Let me tell you a story. Years ago, I was in our elementary school. And I think it was the building where there was about the, the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders. And it was Christmas time. And on one of the bulletin boards in the hallway was this big nativity scene. It was Christmas time with this nativity scene, you know, with the shepherds and Mary and Joseph and the manger and, and the star. And so I, one of the teachers who went to our church, I asked them, I said, how can you continue to do that? And this was her answer to me. We will continue to do that until they force us to take it down. I thought, that's a good answer. Many of our teachers, they, they go to church here. Before they leave to go to the lunchroom, they pray with their class. They pray over their food. 
And I said, well, how can you do that? They said, we'll continue to do that until they force us to quit it. And guess what? In most of the schools around here, they're not going to force you to quit it. My mother, I mentioned this the other day, she taught school for about 30 years. And there was a student in her class that uh, the parents said that, you know, that they're not going to salute the flag and they're not going to say the Lord's Prayer. And uh, the superintendent came to her and said, well, Ann Lee, you, you may have a problem there. And she said, I don't have a problem. Said if the student doesn't want to do it, I'll put him in the hall, but we're going to continue to pray. We're going to continue to salute the flag. And that's what she did. And she did that for 30 years. So sometimes we back down when we shouldn't back down. We need to make a stand. And so Daniel is telling us that you're living, and I'm living, and he was living in a hostile, anti God world through about four different kings, or well, actually more than that, but about four that we have identified in the book of Daniel. So think about some of the things that, that Daniel had to really persevere through. Well, we're going to force you to eat some things that's against your culture, your religion, and your ideology, and your own convictions. And guess what he did? He said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. And then there was a time where they said, we're going to force you that you cannot pray. And guess what Daniel said? No, I'm not going to heed by that. And we read, when that edict from the king went out, nobody's to pray. He went up to his room. He opened the window, faced Jerusalem, and he prayed just like he always prayed. And of course, they listened, and they're trying to uh, get him in trouble. And of course, that's when he's thrown in the den of lions. And God, uh, you know, took care of him through that. It was a miracle. But what, what's Daniel telling us? He's telling us that you can live in a hostile environment, in a culture that's not godly, and still be a godly person. Isn't that a great message? You, you can still live in a hostile world, a culture that is godless, but you can still maintain your integrity, your character, and your relationship with God. You do not have to give in to what the culture and the powers that be are telling you. I believe today that we are headed that direction. Obviously, there are many places that are already like that. If you go to any of the Arab countries, they're not going to allow you to pray or uh, do the things that obviously we do every week. And how many of you know we're blessed with that ability and that freedom to do that? Don't you wish every American would take advantage of that? But they don't. And sometimes we don't know what we have till it's gone. Um, persecution in China to the church. Russia, same way. Through the Muslim world, same way. Many places in Africa, even a few places in South America. Um, but the church has always, the people of God have always had to press through some difficult times and persecution and culture that wasn't really adapting to a godly mentality or a godly way. So I think Daniel's telling us that, that you can continue to live a godly life. And you should continue to pray, you should continue to worship God, and be who God has called you to do, uh, to be, and do what God's called you to do. And through all of that, every leader that Daniel was ever under saw the value of him and what God was doing through him. Whether it was uh, the beginning of Nebuchadnezzar all the way through Darius or Darius or Cyrus, each leader saw the value of this godly man because God put gifts within him that not only blessed Daniel, but blessed the people around him. And I think that's what we should be doing, right? God is using you, He's using me to bless the people around us, even in a culture sometimes that seems rather dark. Now, let's go back to verse number uh, 13. He said, but you go your way till the end. Now, none of us know when our end's going to be. Uh, the last time I looked at the bottom of my foot, there was not an expiration date. So tonight when you get home, look at the bottom of your foot, there will not be an expiration date. 
Uh, and the older I get, the harder it is to look at the bottom of my foot. But I can still do that. So none of us know when our end will be. And, and Daniel didn't know his either. He said, just go uh, on your way until the end. Now, the angel didn't say, Daniel, this is the end. He said, go on your way, which is saying, go continue to do what you do until the end. And spiritually, think about this, spiritually, none of us should retire. Now, we might retire from a job, we might retire from uh, an occupation or career, but spiritually, you don't retire. How many of you know you just keep living for the Lord, doing what God's called you to do, until He says you're done? And so we should continue to do what we do. Obviously, when we get older, things change. There's transitions. Uh, maybe we can't do what we <laughs> were doing when we were 25 or 30. But I'll guarantee we should still be doing what we can do until the time of the end. I've shared this a couple of times that one of the ladies in our church, she's gone on to be with the Lord. I did her service. She was way up in her 80s, close to 90. And um, she would come to church, I mean, every time the doors opened, and she would tell me, she said, Pastor Mike, I, I can't do what I used to do. You know, once I got over 80, I just can't, you know, I can't teach. I can't, you know, make all the things that I used to make. But this is what she said, I pray for you every day. Very humbling. And when she told me that, just tears welled up in my eyes. And the first thing I thought was, I'm not worthy. But she said, Pastor Mike, I pray for you every day. And then it got where she couldn't hardly get out of the house. So we'd go by to see her. We'd take things to her. And she said, but I continue to pray for you every day. I mean, there's something you can do to increase the kingdom. There's something I can do to increase the kingdom. So, so we don't retire from spiritual things. So until the end, Daniel, you continue to do what God has called you to do until your end's over. And then he said, and then you shall rest. How many of you know some people who are resting, they started at 30? <laughs> They've been resting for a long time. So, there is a time of rest, time of death. But the good thing is, he said, but you will arise. And you're going to receive an inheritance. Or we might say, you're going to receive a reward. And Paul gave us kind of the same thing. He said, uh, I know that the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. He said, I've finished my course. He said, I've run this race and I'm going to cross the finish line. And he said, I also know that there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me. But not only for me, but all those who shall love his appearing, talking about Jesus. So every person here, we, we don't know when our end's going to come. We don't know when our time's going to come. And we don't know when Jesus is going to come. But this is what we do know. Whenever that is, and whenever he comes, just like Daniel, we know that there is going to be a reward. There is going to be an inheritance that we receive because we are serving Jesus Christ. The analogy is given in the Bible, and it is a sure word, that Jesus as the Son inherits. And if you know anything about biblical succession, if you will, in inheritance, the oldest child gets the greatest portion. But think about all of us here. We're all sons and daughters of God. And we all get the portion. And you know, God is not going to say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jason, I ran out. I'm sorry, Jared, you know, we, we had enough until you got to your part in line and, you know, I ran out. How I many you know he's the God of more than enough? So he has an inheritance, he has a crown of righteousness for every person who loves him and follows him and trusts him. And then he says that inheritance is going to be at the end of the days. You don't get your reward today. I mean, we get blessings today, but our reward's really not given. I think it was Anne who reminded me of a story about a missionary who had served overseas for years and years and years, and that missionary is coming back on the ocean liner, and 
As people disembark the ocean liner, there are people greeting their family, greeting celebrities, greeting different loved ones, and they're, you know, all hugging and kissing, and the band's playing, and they're partying, and, you know, one thing and another, but there's no one to meet the missionary. They're there all by themselves. And that missionary who had served faithfully for years and years and years said a little prayer to the Lord, said, Lord, there's nobody here to celebrate with me coming home. And God said, Son, you're not home yet. But when you do get home, there's going to be celebration. And that's true for everybody here. And I believe that celebration is going to be out of this world. And it may happen sooner than what we think. Let's stand tonight.